would you do if you found out someone you knew, someone close to you, was missing? In an instant, your irritation at their unexplained absence switches to panic. There's a creeping sense of dread that this is something far more serious than a missed bus or a flat tire. What steps would you take? Perhaps you'd find yourself, as many do, rooted to the spot, paralysed at the very second that you need to be decisive. But this wasn't the initial response of Deirdre Fennick. She wasn't rooted to the spot. She wasn't paralysed. She knew exactly what to do when her daughter Carmel went missing in London in the summer of 1998. Because this wasn't the first, second, or even tenth time her child had gone AWOL. Carmel had a long-standing drug problem, one that had pulled her into the orbit of people and places that no one, let alone a 16-year-old girl, should find themselves. But this time, Deirdre didn't find Carmel. She searched all of the usual haunts and came up empty. How do you convince the authorities that this isn't like the other times? That you're not going to hear the unmistakable rattle of her key in the door at some ungodly hour a day, a week, or even a month from now? How do you persuade a seemingly indifferent world that your child is in genuine danger and that something needs to be done about it, and fast? These were the challenges that faced Deirdre. I'm Pandora Sykes, and you're listening to The Missing, a Podomo podcast series produced by What's the Story Sounds, and brought to you with help from the charities Missing People and Locate International. They believe that all of the cases in this series could still be solved. This is The Missing. Carmel Fennec. I've always been a single mother. I've been on my own now for 30 years. I've raised my kids myself. I've been mother and father to my kids. The only support I ever had was from my family, my mum, my dad, my brothers and sisters. That's my family. That's my kids' family. We have a fantastic network and I'm grateful for that. Carmel is the third of five children. Born on July the 3rd, 1981, in Guy's Hospital in London. Deirdre vividly remembers the moment that she realised her daughter was on the way. My dad panicked, drove me to the hospital. The road was blocked off. We got there just just after one and she was born by half past. (laughs) She came out very quick, (laughs) very quick. Beautiful, beautiful, healthy baby. Absolutely beautiful. Deirdre brought her newborn home, where she introduced her to her siblings, Mandy and Joey. They would be joined a few years later by two more children, David and Casey. We lived in the borough off Great Dover Street. Beautiful, quiet. I I, I grew up there. My mum just lived down the road in Selborne House, Great Dover Street. And the borough is a beautiful place to live. I'd say it's very middle class, <laughs> you know. I had a lovely little flat in, in Kemp House and uh, it's just a really lovely place to live. I had a fantastic childhood there and I think Mandy, Joey and Carmel had a great childhood there. The kids were thick as thieves and Deirdre looks back on those early years fondly. There was always something going There was a house full of people, always, you know, there was always someone one member of family either visiting or, or living with us. And that's that's how it's always been. Water fights, paint fights, hide and seek in the dark. We loved a water fight. <laughs> you know, my dad had popped the shops and come back and asked me flooded. When Carmel turned five, the family were rehoused and found themselves living on the North Peckham estate. It was rough. It was rough. My kids grew up tough, they, they were streetwise, but they also, there was a great sense of community. We had lots of friends. I mean, we had problems there, of course we did. She got into fights and, you know, we had a few um, interactions with some local thugs and drug dealers. But we stood our ground and we stood up to them and 
We got on okay. Like I say, we had, there was good community spirit there. Carmel had a big personality and could always be found with a smile on her face. She was never one to take things too seriously. Her wisecracking continued in school, where making her friends laugh often took precedence over her studies. She wanted to learn. She wanted to do things in life. But because she she turned into the to, to the clown at school, you know, and, you know, laughing and giggling and talking and making jokes in the class with the teachers they're trying to teach, it doesn't bode well for her. Carmel found the transition to secondary school particularly challenging. She went to St Saviour's and St Olive's in the New Kent Road, Great Dover Street. She had a bit of a tough time there. And she was born with uh, one foot and one leg shorter than the other. And so she had a little bit of a pronounced limp, but you know, she, she disguised it well, but she did get teased at school for it. Then one day, completely out of the blue, Carmel's estranged father re-entered the picture. When Carmel was 14, he got in touch and he was living in Malta with a new partner and a new baby, a little boy. And he asked me if she could go over there and visit him and see him. I had great doubts and and fears about her going over there. I didn't want her to go because she hadn't had any contact with him since she was maybe three years old. And all of a sudden he's come out of the woodwork and she, you know, and I thought, okay, maybe he's changed, maybe he's grown up, he's got a new partner, a little baby, half brother to 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 Carmel. I didn't want her to go. And she went, Mum, please let me go, please. Deirdre was torn. On one hand, she'd brought Carmel up on her own for over a decade, and she didn't want to invite sudden upheaval. On the other, she had a young girl standing in front of her, pleading with her for the chance to reconnect with her biological father. She was out there two days when she telephoned me crying uh, because she'd been out, she'd come back, knocked on the door and woke him up and he started screaming and shouting at her. I think he expected a three-year-old child to turn up, not an independent 14-year-old girl who was smoking. And he came on down on her very heavily and so I, in the end, I had to ha- contact uh, Malta Police, Malta High Commission, Interpol were involved to get her to, to a place of safety and, and flown back home. She begged me and I let her go. It was the biggest mistake I ever made. I just knew. I just knew it was wrong. Everything changed after that Malta trip. In the years leading up to it, Carmel had gradually become more and more self-reliant, going to sleepovers, spending all day in town with her friends, normal teenage girl stuff. But after she came back, things escalated. She was very, very strong-willed, very independent. And, you know, she'd go, I'm going to stay out of friends tonight. I go, okay, okay, darling, you know, stay safe, come back, see you in the morning. And then things were changing and happening. I thought, I didn't really... Took notice, but didn't take notice. Because you think, oh, she's that age. She's going through puberty, stroppy teenager. I didn't realise that it was something much more serious, much more serious, until she stayed away a couple of days. And I've now gone looking for her to this friend's house. And they went, no, Carmel hasn't been here. I haven't seen Carmel in months. We don't sort of hang around anymore. And I'm thinking, well, where is she then? And then the more I looked and the more questions I asked, the more I got told from other friends of hers that they no longer hung around with her because she was hanging around with totally different people and that she was heavily into drugs. At the age of 14, whilst at a party, Carmel was introduced to crack cocaine by a friend and she'd been using it heavily ever since. Deirdre was completely and utterly blindsided. I was thinking, how could I miss this? How could I not see? Because the view and the media is a lot to blame for this. When they they show you 
junkies that's with air quotes pictures of junkies look at this this one's been on crack cocaine this is how she looked five years ago this is how she looks now and look at this one sniffing glue look at this drug addict look at that drug addict they're all dirty disheveled scabbed up faces scabbed up teeth missing my camel didn't look like that at all and that's the signs you're looking for but it's not so there are lots of people out there that take drugs and you would never know. There are no outward signs. The revelation put Carmel's lengthy disappearances into context. She was moving in a new, much older circle. On a typical day, Carmel would bunk off school, link up with her new friends and find drugs, before eventually finding somewhere to sleep off the effects. It was shocking to hear. People saying to me, she's sleeping on stairwells, she's in derelict garages. And I'm thinking, she's sleeping in a stairwell, maybe 500 yards from her home. Just come home, why doesn't she come home? And then myself and Joey, we used to go looking for her when she'd be gone for days. And Mandy used to look after David and Casey. After they'd come home from school, we'd give them their supper, put them to bed, and then me and Joey would just traipse the streets early hours of the morning, kicking in crack house doors, looking for her. And we'd find her sometimes. Sometimes we'd find her and bring her home and, you know, keep reporting her missing to the police. Occasionally, when Carmel pulled a vanishing act, she'd return home to an empty house without her keys and have to make use of some unconventional methods of entry. I remember she'd been gone for a, about three or four days. So I'm now heading to London it's the weekend, looking for her. So I'm in London looking for her. When I come home later that evening, she's indoors. She she went, I had to break the window to get in because the house was locked and it was cold outside. And I thought, you're such a cheeky mare. But, but she was home. I had the window repair. Two weeks later, she did the exact same thing. I'm up in London looking for her. She's come home, can't get in. She breaks the window to get in. But I'm just, and we should get away with that, you know? She'd be gone for a week and she'd come back, walk in the door like she'd only brought the shops and back. What baffled Deirdre most was how normal her daughter seemed when she was at home. Carmel was never rude. Never came in with attitude to me. Never, ever gave me back chat. But you could, you could see there were some subtle changes in her. It's hard to explain. It's not like she suddenly come in and went, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah well, whatever. Uh, she never, ever, ever spoke to me like that, ever. It was like two different people. I mean, I, I remember coming into the living room one day, she was sat in front of the TV and she was listening to Puff Daddy, uh, I'll Be Missing You. And I just walked up behind her and we, and we just hugged. Nothing was said, nothing needed to be said, just, you know, we just hugged. For a long time, Carmel managed to keep her two lives separate. But one day, the worlds violently collided. There's only one time I ever rowed with her and really lost the plot with her, and I did hit her. I do regret that. She said, oh, I'll, I'll pick Casey up from, from school. And I said, OK, darling, you know. And she picked Casey up from, from, from school at three o'clock. Nine o'clock that night, they still hadn't come home. Me and Joey, we're out searching for them. Pop back home and show it, you know, if she'd been back. Next thing, Casey came in the back gate by herself at about 10 o'clock at night. Where's, where's Carmel? And she went, now Casey was about four or five. And she went, she'd gone to get me sweets. I know Joey, run, run. Catch her, catch her, Joey, because I know she hasn't gone far, but she's left that child on the street by herself to come into the house and she's gone and I actually caught up with her and, and discovered that she had been sat in a crack house all afternoon with, with, with Casey and I just hit her I just punched her I did I just couldn't control myself just, why why even after that you know a week later she's back home like nothing's happened and I'm, I'm beside myself that I've done that beside myself and that, so I think that was the deciding moment to, to get the heck out of, out, of, out of London and I spoke to her and she went okay yeah okay mum I'll do it I'll do it 
And I went, okay, darling, we'll, you know, we have a fresh start. It'll be good. Deirdre felt her best chance at keeping her daughter safe was to get her as far from the city as possible. A neighbour of ours had moved to Crawley a few years previously and wanted to come back to Peckham. And I said, well, you know my house. And she said, well, do you want to do an exchange? And we agreed. And I uprooted my children to get Carmel out of Peckham and away from all those influences. I left Joey behind. I left Mandy behind. I just, I left my brothers, my sisters, everyone behind just to get her out of that situation. I didn't even know where Crawley was. I never had a clue. Carmel hadn't put up any resistance to the London exodus. In fact, she was all for it, or so she said. But when the day of the move finally rolled around, she was nowhere to be seen. The day we moved to here, we were packing up uh, the removal vans and that, and she'd gone on the missing list again. And uh, Casey's dad, he drove me down in the first uh, removal van and he said, I promise you, Deirdre, we'll find her. We'll find her. And I, I cried all the way from, from, from there to Crawley because we didn't have her with us. And, when, and then about 10 o'clock that night, the last of... My, my my home from London came down in the second van and she was in the van she was she, they found her and bought her home we settled into to uh, Crawley tried to make you know a lovely house loved it there but old habits die hard she kept going out and heading back to London she'd be gone for a couple of days and then she'd come back and then she'd be gone for a week and I'd have to leave David and Casey with total strangers so I could go up to London and find her and bring her home again. Constantly back and forth, back and forth. And for a while now, Carmel's extracurricular activities had been bringing her some unwanted attention from the authorities. She'd been caught shoplifting in Redhill or somewhere like that and me and my dad had to go down and, and bail her out. When Deirdre spoke to the police on that occasion, she learned that her daughter hadn't been alone. She was with an older white man and he drives a car and apparently she was shoplifting with this man. Efforts to get Carmel to tell her more about this mystery man fell on deaf ears and she firmly denied having a boyfriend. But Deirdre knew there was something going on, a fact she had confirmed when late one night she was woken up by the telephone ringing. I got a phone call from her and it's sort of midnight and she's crying. She's in it. She cannot barely breathe. She's in a quite a bad way. And I said to her, where are you? She went, I, I, I'm in a phone box in Brixton. He's beat me. I went, who's beat you? She went, no, no, no. Look, my, help. I need help. I went, listen, I'm going to call the police. You're not in trouble. They're there. They're going to come there to help you. That's all. Stay where you are. Tell me exactly where you are and I will get you help. I'm in Crawley. She's in Brixton. Midnight. So I called the police and the police found her. She was in a bad way. And they actually, God bless them, they brought her all the way home to Crawley. Deirdre and Carmel spent a lot of time together over the next fortnight. They were never anything less than close, but during that two-week period, as Carmel recuperated, Deirdre felt like she was truly getting through to her child for the first time in a long time. And she, she healed. She, she, she was actually looking really, really well. That's when that last photograph was taken. I'd arranged for um, a professional photographer to come and take some photos of the kids for me because we had this special deal that was going on and she went mum mum please let me have one done on my own and I'm thinking come well this is costing me a fortune I can't afford it let alone do it. And I mean I'll go on then just go on we'll have one of her on herself because there's a photo of the th of her David and Casey together 
and then she had the one done individually. And that was the last photo I ever had taken of her. Deirdre's joy at having her daughter safe and sound under her roof was short-lived. Eventually, Carmel did what she always did, and she took off for London. Deirdre expected she'd be back soon. She always was. And she carried on as usual. Then one morning, she received a phone call from a London police officer by the name of Matt Robinson. What an amazing guy. Matt and Deirdre were well acquainted. He had picked up Carmel a number of times over the years and had taken to looking out for her and keeping her mother informed of her whereabouts. That morning, he called up to tell Deirdre that Carmel was due in court later that day and that she needed to get to London as soon as possible. So I said, okay. So left my kids with with a neighbour again, shot to London, got to Camberwell Courts. And he went, I've, I've managed to hold them off. She'll be up in a minute into the court. So I'm in the court now. And when she come up from the cells, oh my God, my heart was ripped from my chest. She's wearing clothes that are like five times too big for her. She couldn't have weighed five stone. I mean, she's not a tall girl, but she there was nothing of her. And I looked at her and I started crying. I went, please, can't, don't. She went, it's all right, mum, I'm all right. I'm all right, mum. I went, no, look, you're not all right. And I sat in that court and I begged that judge to lock her up, make her a ward of court, anything, lock her up, throw, just do something, because if you don't do something now, my child will be dead in six months. The judge told Deirdre that the best he could do was refer Carmel to the local authority in Crawley. Deirdre agreed, but she asked the judge for some very specific bail conditions. She said Carmel's best chance at recovery was an extended stay in a children's centre. I said, but her bail conditions must be she is not to reside at my address because I know what social services would do. Oh, we've got nowhere for her. Can she stay at yours? And they just passed the buck. And she's not to go into Stratton, Brixton and, and other areas. Deirdre's plan worked. For a while, at least. They put her into a, a, a children's home sort of thing, but it wasn't a secure unit. She could, she could go off out all day, do what she wanted to do, but she had to be back in there by nine o'clock at night. And she did that. And she was talking to Mandy on the phone. She was talking to me. Things were good. And I, was, I said to her, I, Calm, I didn't do this because I don't love you, darling. I did this because I love you. I love you so much. And she went, I know, Mum. I need help and I'm going to get it this time. And that was basically the last conversation I had with her. A few days later, Mandy received a phone call from Carmel. She told her sister that she thought she might be pregnant and that she was going to London that Saturday, the 23rd of May, to tell the man she believed to be the father. That was the last conversation anyone from Carmel's family would have with her. She, she went to London and then on the Saturday morning I got a phone call from the police officer saying she's in court, they, can you get here? I went, I can't. I've got no one to have the kids. I haven't even got the fare to get to London and I would never make it in time by the time she was dealt with. And that was the last day she was in court. That's when she walked out of court that day where the judge fined, he went, how much money have you got on you? She went, six pound. He fined her five pound and let a 16-year-old child walk at that court with a pound knowing her address is West Sussex. And she's never been seen since. After a few days without contact from Carmel, Deirdre began to suspect her daughter had once again pulled her usual disappearing act. She's going to go to ground. I'm taking the two kids away. I'll look for her when I come back. Deirdre had booked a week in a caravan park for herself, David and Casey. She hoped that by the time they returned home, Carmel would have turned up safe and sound as per usual. When we came back from the caravan holiday, I knew something was seriously, seriously wrong. It was now June, and no one, not even Mandy, who Carmel never went more than a few days without phoning, 
had heard from Carmel in weeks. Deirdre knew this time was different, but when she went to the police, she struggled to get them to treat Carmel's disappearance with the urgency she knew it deserved. Because she'd been reported missing so many times before, I went, no, she's not a runaway. She's missing. There's something seriously wrong. Deirdre's memories of that first week of her daughter's disappearance are hazy. The early days are an absolute blur and a nightmare. Um, I was recommended to get in touch with missing people because the police weren't really doing much at all. So I contacted missing people. They took on her case and they have been the most outstanding, supportive people in the last 24 years. She recalls long nights spent staking out Carmel's usual London stomping grounds with Mandy in tow. Mandy drove. Uh, Mandy would, would sit up, parked up in the street that there was a possible sighting of her all night long. Mandy would sit in her car all night long. Now, Mandy's ill. Mandy's very ill. She has Crohn's disease. And for her to be sitting in a car all night, just waiting for a possible sighting of her sister or a sighting of somebody that might know her, you know, just trying to get any information, any possible sightings of her, and there was nothing, absolutely nothing. One thing she remembers with utmost clarity is the nightmare that unfolded because Carmel had gone missing in London, a different police jurisdiction to where Deirdre lived in Crawley, West Sussex. The problem with the police is because Carmel went missing in the metropolitan area, I live in West Sussex, there's a a conflict of interest. Any information comes in that goes to West Sussex police, then has to be passed down to metropolitan police because it's out of their jurisdiction, if you get what I mean. So if a sighting comes in and it's sent to West Sussex, they can't then drive up to London and investigate that. They have to then request that Metropolitan Police do it. So by the time all this goes around, that sighting's long gone. Deirdre wanted the ground to swallow her up after Carmel went missing, to hide away from the world, to mourn her daughter, but she had four other children to look out for. I was just on autopilot. I used to get up in the morning, get Casey and and, and, and David ready for school, take them to school, drop them off, come home and just sit and cry all day. Just sit and cry. Just couldn't function. And then to try and straighten yourself up and, and, and not let them see what you've been through during the day to pick your children up from school and bring them home, just waiting for a knock on the door or a phone call or something, or for her to just come in the back door, or even to come home from the shop and find a window broken and her sit in the, in the kitchen. Years went by without a breakthrough, and Deirdre started to ask herself, was it because Carmel was the wrong kind of missing person? You're just, you're doing nothing. You've done nothing because she doesn't fit the pretty upper-class, middle-class family. She's just some throwaway child of some dirty, rough estate in Peckham. Well, she's not. She's my child. My children are not throwaway children. Today, almost 25 years after her disappearance, Deirdre is more certain than ever that something happened to her daughter, that she didn't simply run away to start a new life elsewhere. Whatever went on with Carmel, if we'd rat today, she'd walk in this door two days later like nothing had happened. Hello, Mum. All right, put the kettle on or, Mum, you know, got what you got to eat. My girl would never go away. And despite her issues with the police's investigation, she'll forever have a place in her heart for PC Matt Robinson. Him and his partner, me and Mandy, would go up to up to Brixton and they would drive us around. If there'd be a sight, they would drive us around and we'd see if we could see her up around Campbell or wherever. When he was off duty, he used to be out and about looking for her as well. The man has since immigrated to Australia and I'm still in contact with him now, 24 years later. He now has two beautiful daughters who are now just a little bit older than Carmel was when she disappeared. And he didn't want to bring his children up 
here when he saw what was going on. He didn't want to have children and raise his children in this country. Deirdre did everything she could to keep her daughter's case in the public eye over the years. Talking to the press, doing radio interviews and deploying social media publicity campaigns. It was vital for her to make sure she took active steps to ensure Carmel was not forgotten. But speaking so openly about her child's disappearance took a toll on her, something she only came to realise during a television appearance with former MP and broadcaster Robert Kilroy Silk. I travelled up to London and arrived at the studios and there was all these people there and it suddenly just hit me and I just, I couldn't speak, I couldn't... Um, and these were all families and people in the same situation. I had children missing. And I had to go to the toilets because I couldn't, I couldn't look at anyone, I couldn't speak to anyone. And, and then a lady stepped up from missing people. She went to me, hello, she went, you're Deirdre, aren't you? I went, yeah. And she was my liaison with missing people. And she actually sat with me the whole time and she got me through that programme and listened to other people's stories. And and that's when you, you know it's real. My child is missing. In the 25 years since Carmel was last seen, not one shred of evidence has emerged that could shed light on her case. I mean, somebody has obviously, well, committed the perfect crime. They've got away with it. Deirdre is certain that someone out there knows what happened to her daughter. That child didn't just disappear. There were other people there involved. And how they sleep at night, I don't know. Do they have children? Do they kiss their children goodnight when they put them to bed? I can't do that with my child no more. I can't hug my child no more. What she wants, what she needs, is for someone to come forward. Someone who can bring closure to a chapter that for decades now has had no ending. Like I say, if anyone, anyone has any information, even how the smallest piece could be that piece, that little piece of this puzzle to help solve this, you know, please... Beg you, please. Ease this family suffering. <laughs> In many cases, it takes just one piece of information to lead police or family to the answers they crave. If you know what happened to Carmel, or you remember seeing someone like her on May the 21st, 1998, your information could be vital. Even if you've never heard of Carmel Fennec before listening to this episode, you could still help. Visit our website, themissingpodcast.org, where you'll find more information on this and every other case we featured on this podcast. There, you can join an online movement one dedicated to supporting the investigations for all the cases we've covered, including the one you're listening to right now. Since the launch of The Missing Podcast, over 300 volunteers have joined community investigation teams led by Locate International. In the UK alone, there are over 12,000 long-term missing and unidentified people. To support Locate's efforts and to learn more about the vital work they do, visit locate.international where you can join the mission to help locate the missing. The series is also made in collaboration with the charity Missing People, who work tirelessly to support the families of the missing. Their helpline is open to offer support and advice if you've been affected by anything in this episode. You can reach them by calling or texting 116000 or by emailing them at 116000 at missingpeople.org.uk. We cannot say this enough. It takes just one person with the right information to solve any of the cases in this series. Deirdre hopes that the information will soon arrive 
to solve this one. The Missing is a podcast from Podomo and What's the Story Sounds. It's hosted by me, Pandora Sykes. The episodes are researched and produced by Jacka Kennedy. The executive producers for Podomo are Jake Chudnow and Matt White. And the executive producers for What's the Story Sounds are Daryl Brown and Sophie Ellis.